So hopefully you guys uh, had a chance to watch the other video a little bit. Um, I gave some some kind of basic overview on antibody drug conjugates, and we're going to go into one really cool paper today. And then you'll have uh, another. While well, your your final homework assignment's already been posted, and it's kind of related to the, the lecture material today, so it'll it'll you know it'll help to uh, kind of understand that and follow it a bit. Um, and if you have questions today, because we're going to cover some pretty cool stuff, uh, you can either try chatting or just blurt out, you know, like, I have a question or something like that. Um, and uh, and I can, we, we can talk about this, right? Um, okay, so, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, in the asynchronous lecture, I went through uh, some of this uh, PowerPoint. I, I did change one of the slides. I just want to show you what, what change I did. So this is based on the asynchronous lecture stuff. Um, uh, what I wanted to do was was this one. Yeah, this this uh, slide which I showed is a uh, typical example of a of an antibody drug conjugate um, where you have this kind of left side attachment group to the to the antibody, and then there's some kind of um, uh, a linker, right? A linker that um, is cleavable. It's a cleavable linker. All right. So hopefully you got you you understood that from the from the um, from the asynchronous lecture. What's cathepsin? Anybody know? Or do you remember what, what cathepsin is? Um, so it's a uh, a protease, right? It's, a, it's something that cleaves peptides, and it cleaves the the uh, this peptide bond right here, um, and that that causes this whole thing to sort of collapse. And then this thing on the right, MMAE, is the is the warhead. This is actually this kills the tumor basically. It binds to um, tubulin, and it has this anti-cancer activity. So what I did in in this slide is I kind of showed that a little more clearly. Oh yeah, yeah. I did, well, this is from before. Uh, valsit, valsit is valine, citrulline, and citrulline is not uh, the same as lysine. It kind of looks like lysine, except lysine has an extra carbon, and citrulline has this urea linkage thing at the bottom. But the big thing is that valsit is recognized by cathepsin, which is a protease. And that causes that allows the protease to cleave this key peptide linkage right here. Um, okay, and when that happens, oh yeah, it's, and, and and this the other thing that's kind of cool is four amino benzyloxycarbamate. That's this spacer. Okay, what's the role of a spacer? Well, I mean it it creates space between the linker and the, the warhead, that's one thing it does, but it actually is able to fall off, which is really cool. And we'll show the mechanism of how it falls off also. Um, and then the warhead is monomethyl uh, aristatin, MMAE, which is the cytotoxic pe peptide. That's the thing on the right that basically uh, will, you know, kill the tumor. Um, okay, so this is what I added to my slide. Part one, amide bond gets cleaved. So specifically this amide bond, the, the cathepsin, which, and cathepsins are upregulated in tumor cells. So it's a protease that's actually you know, highly, highly expressed in, in tumor cells. This gets cleaved, right? That creates a carboxylic acid and uh, NH2. And then the whole left side, including the antibody, gets, gets uh, lost. This spacer gets lost also. It's a cool mechanism, and we'll show that later. But basically, you can imagine the um, NH2, you know, free NH2, pu pushes its electrons in. The double bond pushes in. This double bond pushes in. This thing gets lost as CO2, carbon dioxide, which is really cool. And then you, you at the very end, the full structure of the warhead gets liberated. So the warhead gets completely, with all of its atoms, released um, inside the cell. Super cool. Um, more t details on that later. And okay, anyway, so this I just modified the slide, uh, and this is all from the asynchronous lecture. So I'm gonna jump now to the fun stuff. 
So hopefully you watched the, the asynchronous lecture. Um, if not, you know, you might want to watch that also before you try to do the homework. Um, okay, so I'm jumping ahead a bit. Uh, ah, sorry, one sec. So now I'm jumping to page uh, 13 of the uh, presentation, which is uh, kind of where we got in the asynchronous lecture. This the synthesis of tubulice and B. Tubulice and B is is kind of like an improved warhead, right? MMAEs, the first or kind of first generation uh, one. This is like a like a latter generation warhead. Okay, so this is actually fun because it's uh, it's it's uh, chemistry, and we we know you know you guys have learned a lot of chemistry in the last semester, so a lot of this makes sense. I'm gonna re I'm gonna re review the um, the um, the, the retrosynthesis, which is what I talked about in the asynchronous lecture also. But yeah, it's this kind of crazy looking molecule, and, the, and this can be made by multi-step synthesis. Only only a, a handful of steps to create this, and it's all its chiral centers. So the abstract was a uh, first total synthesis of tubulicin B is described. Um, a zeridine route, uh, um, was a was kind of a method that they used to well um, it was they they had a method to create this right side that was kind of clever and that's what we're going to talk about but basically they're just snapped together a couple building blocks all right all right so retrosynthesis I talked about this in the asynchronous lecture uh, that's the molecule retrosynthesis just means let's do synthesis going backwards so they looked around and they're like which bond do we want to do it create at the very end of the synthesis and they decided this little squiggly right here we know amides is an easy to make functional group you can make them with edci and you know peptide coupling re reagents so basically they they snipped it right there and they they got the carboxylic acid part and then they got the amine part and they were, they were like well we can just create that bond at the very end so last step of the synthesis make the bond right and then they're, they're like we're, they're gonna kind of disconnect this left piece and disconnect the right piece I think I first show the the right piece. Where did they disconnect here? Well, it looks like they disconnected kind of this bottom couple carbons and stuff. Um, I'll show it in this in the in the forward synthesis in a little bit. But essentially, they they were able to create a CC bond, a carbon carbon bond, and using something called the Wittig reaction. You know, you remember the Wittig that that may be something you forgot from organic two, but you, usually you do learn it in organic two. It basically makes alkenes. It's a way to make an alkene. So they make an alkene, and then they reduce the alkene. It's really easy to reduce an alkene too, right? Okay, so then let's jump over to the left again. So now you can see that they um, they dis disconnect this thing into two pieces, the kind of left piece and the right piece. The left piece is very simple, and the right piece is a little more complicated. So, but the left piece they they attach. This is uh, pretty cool. They they um, this is, looks weird, right? It's 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 really just a leaving group. It's called pentafluorophenol. This is kind of like a chloride or something, but it's it's very fine tuned for peptide type synthesis, right? So this PFP group is cool because it can be kicked off. This is weird, azide, right? Azide N three, which you know another organic two functional group, um, but um, they kind of use azide as a protecting group, so. Azide is sort of protected, and then they, they can reduce it to an NH2, and then you know, the, and then that would become this, and the, the NH2 attacks, kicks off the leaving group, and makes the amide. So, so this is a, but th th then this is basically the building block they need to make, right? So they're they're gradually snipping this this piece up, and they're making more simple molecules, and then they essentially. Um, start at this point which is the amine here so with the idea that they can they can attach this weird isoleucine looking azide amino acid really easily right easy to make amide bonds you know that very well now and then they also make this weird hemiaminal thing which is actually part of the drug that's a kind of a weird bond but it's really easy to make so this is this is an, an unusual functional group right but it is part of the drug, and they need it, so they 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 make it. And I'll show you how you how you how they make it in a second. 
All right, so basically what they then need to do is they need to make fundamental starting material number one and they need to make fundamental starting material number two. Once you got, uh, once you um, uh, start with these, you can push them to the end and then they snap these two get together and you make uh, two by some B, all right? All right, so a little bit of a synthesis paper, but it's, it's not that bad and it's all based on your organic knowledge, organic one and two knowledge. So, um, so let's start with this fundamental starting material number one. Um, so they, I think they're able to buy this. It's like a amino alcohol with a Bach group and a primary alcohol and a benzyl, a benzyl ether, which is just a protecting group of the aromatic oxygen. So they do something called a tempo oxidation, which is a, uh, it's like a PCC type style oxidation to make the aldehyde. Tempo is very environmentally friendly, so it's like a nice, um, it's a very, very uh, non, you know, hazardous, well, pretty sure it's not hazardous, non-environmentally -env destroying um, oxidation reagent, unlike chromium, which is kind of bad for the environment. They have an aldehyde. So then they do this thing called a horner wadsworth emmons reaction, which is kind of like that idea, like a Wittig, which is sort of a, you, you can read that in your organic tuba. In a nutshell, this carbon is nucleophilic, attacks the aldehyde, and then you lose the oxygen and the phosphorus and you get an alkene. So it's like a, it's a nucleophilic reaction, kind of like a Grignard or something. So this carbon attacks there, lose the oxygen, lose the phosphorus. Now you have an alkene, okay? That's kind of what they wanted to do, but then they need to actually reduce the alkene. How do you reduce an alkene? Organic one, organic one reaction is H2 palladium, right? So they hit this with H2 palladium and the alkene becomes an alkane. Oh no, they create a chiral center and they get a mixture of stereoisomers. So you get the, the, the dash 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 and the wedge one, and that was inseparable, inseparable. So they get a mixture of, you know, not, not enantiomers, but diastereomers. These are, uh, you know, chiral di diastereomers, okay? Inseparable. Well, that's a big problem, right? How can you do anything with this if it's inseparable? Well, what they did is they kept going, and then they were able to separate it later, okay? Because you wouldn't want to put this into your drug, right? A mixture of <laughs> diastereomers. So they're able to eventually separate these. So what they do is now they do lithium hydroxide, which uh, cleaves the ethyl ester. Then they do HCl ethyl acetate, which cleaves the Bach group. So that you know how to do that. You, you learned about that in one of your homework assignments. Bach group comes off with acid, HCl. And then they're able to separate. And then they have the 7A and 7B. 7A is natural stereochemistry. 7B is non-natural stereochemistry. But um, they decide, well, we made them both. So why don't we put them both into the drug and see what happens, right? So they'll make, make one, put one into the drug, the natural one put the other one into the drug, the non-natural one, and then maybe they can test the biological activity and see, does that, does that chiral center even matter, right? Uh, and just for reference, this they're calling this 2S and this is 2R, you can double check that. 2S is natural, 2R is non-natural, okay? All right, so now fundamental starting material number two, what are they gonna do? Um, so they, uh, they're able to like, make this pretty easily or purchase it or something. It's, you know, this is like what they start with. Uh, they use a, a literature reference to just do a couple things. Um, attach the isoleucine amino acid with the azide, a weird protecting group almost. Azide is almost a protecting group for nitrogen, which is, I have to confess that is kind of a rare thing. I haven't seen that too much myself in my organic chemistry training. Um, and then the other thing they did is they converted the acetate, which is an ester, into a TES, which is a triethylsilyl, which is a uh, protecting group. So it's just an oxygen protecting group, all right? So that's, they just used reference, literature reference to do that. Um, this is where they attach the funny hemi-aminal, which is the CH2 in the oxygen. All they do is uh, use a strong base, rips off the proton, and then the nitrogen attacks the carbon, kicks off the chloride. Uh, this is a kind of a weird, another weird functional group called a, a chloroformate. And, but anyway, this is a, you can purchase this kind of chemical. Nitrogen attacks, 
you have your hemi aminal. Very nice. Then they do H2 palladium, which does a couple things. Well, they do H2 palladium, and they they and then they also have this thing in the mixture. So they do two things at once. This is the the funny amino acid with the PFP group. It's a pentafluorophenol that we showed. It's a leaving group, right? So the H2 palladium reduces the azide, and then the azide attacks the carbon, kicks off the PFP group, and then they got this stuff. Okay. And then anything else? Oh yeah. So then they just do they they take off the test group, they take off the methyl group with ester hydrolysis, like lithium hydroxide. Test is silicon, you use fluoride, F minus, F minus attacks silicon. And then that essentially gave them the, the alcohol to get the alcohol. And then they do alcohol plus acetic anhydride, which is a acetylating agent. And then, ah, they got the acetate. Good. That's what they needed. So, so cool. They successfully made this important building block. Okay. We cool? Everybody cool so far? So far, not that hard. Okay, now they do the final product, tubulysin B. And they also make the stereoisomer, which is called an epimer, based on that the, the wrong stereoisomer, or the right wrong stereochemistry of their other building block. Just to see, why not? They got it, stick it in there and see if it's biologically active, right? So this is how they did it. So they start with this, this building block they, they, they created. First, they, they love this PFP group, so they're going to attach a PFP group. This is based on the chemistry you guys know. They just use uh, DIC, diisopropyl carbodiamide. You, you, you learned about that in EDCI. And pentafluorophenol. Remember, the mechanism is pretty easy. Nitrogen attacks the proton, makes an O minus. O minus reattacks the carbodiamide, and then now it has got a leaving group on it. And then the phenol attacks, kicks off the leaving group. Ah, now you have the PFP group. This is what we call a well-behaved leaving group. So it's not, it's it's a good leaving group, but it's not so good that it's like unstable. It also allows protecting group-free peptide coupling. What that means is when they react it with the uh, the other component, that other component doesn't need to have protecting groups on it because it's cool if you can avoid protecting groups. So this is a, a pretty clever strategy. They can make this. They can make a large amount of this and then use it in protecting group-free peptide coupling. Okay. All right, so how do they do that? So now what I'm showing is basically there's kind of two, two routes. They use their little PFP protected piece, and then they're using uh, one amino acid that they created. It's called 7A with the correct stereochemistry. And that makes the product, tubulase and B, right up here. And then they, they also use the other amino acid with the other wrong stereoisomer, the non-natural stereochemistry, and that creates the product on the bottom. They're calling that epi tubulase and B, all right? So very easily they created the natural drug and its epimer, which is, you can see uh, 2S here, Translates it to 2S there. 2R here, the non natural one, translates to 2R there. Now they created two molecules and then they're able to test them side by side. Which one do you think is going to be the good one? I mean, you might predict that the natural one is, right? But that's but they'll see that it doesn't actually matter. These are both active. <laughs> so it just shows that the stereoisomer is not that big of a deal, which is a little surprising, but you know, drugs are kind of mysterious that way. Okay, so interestingly, natural 2S and the 2R epi tubulase B have similar biological activity. They're using something called GI50, which is kind of like IC50. It's called growth inhibition, 50%. So they get 50% of the growth inhibition of a cancer cell line. All right, so here we are. Here's our two molecules, tubulase B and epi tubulase B. And uh, there's the 2S, there's the 2R, and here's the table. So natural tubulase B is the naturally occurring substance. It's actually pretty uh, potent against two cancer cell types, PC3 or prostate cancer cell. Uh, HT29 is a colon cancer cell. 
And uh, but the, interestingly, the, t the synthetic is still still doesn't quite match it, and it's that's a little surprising. But you know, it's within a you know it's within a error bars, 1.1 versus 1.0 nanomolar. And then interestingly, the the, the non-natural one 2R is actually pretty good. I mean, maybe even better against PC3, maybe a little bit worse against HD29. HD but that one stereo center is not does not just destroy the activity. That's kind of interesting. Okay, there's their two S, yeah, and then there's the two R. Okay, cool. Uh, so it suggests the C terminal side may, may not play an important role in the binding or you know binding to tubulin because it's binding to tubulin, which is why it kills cancer cells. Okay, cool. All right, so now we're on to the the grand finale. Uh, I if if I don't finish this at six fifteen, I may just keep going and just be done with it. Uh, but it should it should we should be able to. And please ask questions if anything uh, is confusing. You can put your hand up or chat. All right. So development of tubulized analogs as a new class of ADCs. So this is a, a Genentech paper. So just down the road, um, Genentech's an amazing company for a lot of reasons. But they they make they make antibody drug conjugates as one of their, you know, market areas. And so this paper is called Stabilizing a Tubulized and Antibody Drug Conjugate to Enable Activity Against Multi-Drug Resistant Tumors. ACS Medical Medicinal Chemistry Letters 2017. So this paper is on the iLearn site also. Okay, so here's the, the paper. Um, the, the lead author is Liana Staben and the there's the first author is Stabe and the, the last author is Pillow. Usually those are the most significant authors in a paper, right? The St uh, Pillow is a pretty uh, senior Genentech scientist who does a lot of this antibody drug conjugate stuff. Uh, so there, it's Genentech. There's also this company called Wuxi, W-U-X-I, and they're, uh, they're actually a pretty well-known company in China that they, they kind of supplement papers like this and they do uh, contracting, right? So they might help with like metabolism studies and you know microsome stability, uh, cytochrome P450. They're really good at those kind of things. I'm, I'm a little surprised the Genentech contracted that out because they have they do everything in San Francisco. But uh, anyway, so Wuxi was um, was uh, employed here also. Uh, I'm gonna maybe I'll I'm not gonna read this whole thing. Um, but this basically shows the main result of the paper. Um, one of the one of the um, um, things we'll show is that they that what they found is R is the this little group up here. If it's acetate, because we we saw it be acetate, that is actually um, uh, it, it was found to be like degrade, so <laughs> like degrade in vivo. So. A lot of what this paper discovered was that if they use n-propyl, so propyl, carbon, 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 that the ether is actually uh, more stable. So they, but they, they should have a lot of cool data, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through it all. Okay, you can read the abstract later. The paper is online also. Okay, good. All right, so just reading a couple quotes from the paper. Over the last 40 years. Antibody drug conjugates have been employed to rescue highly potent cytotoxic small molecules uh, that exhibit limited therapeutic activity to dose limiting toxicities when administered as a free drug. The idea of that is if, if you, I mean, a lot of chemicals and, you know, natural products are very potent anti-tumor drugs, right? But if you, if you would uh, administer them like as a free drug, it's actually kind of toxic to you. So if there's a way to kind of specifically target a, a cancer cell, then the, the toxicity of the drug doesn't really matter because the, you know, it's still attached to, uh, well, when it's attached to the antibody, it's not toxic, right? Okay, tubulin inhibitors we've been talking about, in particular, have comprised a vast majority of drug types utilized in antibody drug conjugates. Um, so t inhibiting tubulin is a very common drug target for these uh, ADCs. Almost all of these tubulin inhibitors have been aristatins. Remember that? We, that was one of the ones we talked about in the in the um, you know overview of these ADCs. Or 
metansinoids, uh, uh, as you know, found in the approved drugs, um, adcetrus and cadcilla. Cadcilla, <laughs> I don't know the pronunciation. Um, okay, so yeah, MMAE is monomethyl R-statin. That's one of the ones that's commonly used in a bunch of antibody drug uh, conjugates. Okay. Uh, and then there's this one. It's kind of a different sort of style one, but they both target tubulin, mirror tensing. Um, and so, yeah, these are called second generation ADC warheads. Tubulicin, the one we were just talking about, that's a third generation one, actually. So it's, um, it's like a little more modern. It has some special effects that are, uh, that make it better than MMAE. All right. But this is a, this is a cool starting point. This is also kind of a peptide like, Thing. The structure's a little different, but it also binds to tubulin. Okay, so um, the tubulicins, you know, what we just synthesized here, are similar to the aristatins in their linear peptidic structure. Yeah, you know, right. They're they're actually kind of different in their structure, but they are linear peptidic like molecules. They're a class of highly potent cytotoxic natural products. Um, one second. Um, highly uh, potent cytotoxic natural products they inhibit tubulin polymerization and they disintegrate microtubules in dividing cells. So it's, it's, that's how it kills cancer cells, right? The tubulicins bind to the vinca domain, which I, I talked about in the last lecture. That's where vinblastine and other vinca alkaloids bind. But unlike Monomethyl, monomethyl aristatin, they're able to bind to the beta subunit alone, perhaps explaining their higher affinity. So the big thing is tubulicins bind with a higher affinity than MMAE. So it's, that's a good thing, right? And it, it might, they might be a little better. Um, so there is MMAE, which is found in drugs like Etcetris. And here's our tubulicin. So there's actually a lot of differences. I mean, they really don't look the same, right? The, this, the structure of the uh, amino acids is different. The functional group arrangement is different. Okay. Uh, yeah, all right, good. So there's there they are. Um, and they're going to basically focus this paper on, on a tubulicin antibody drug conjugate. So one of the most compelling reasons to investigate tubulicins is they are not effluxed by PGP-11. Unlike MMAE, which is, that is a huge deal, right? What's PGP? Anybody remember PGP? Well, PGP. Um, it, was, it was the protein that, it's a multi-drug resistance protein. So it's expressed in tumor cells and other organs and, and things. And it basically effluxes drugs. So it's like hard, like it also effluxes them out of the brain. You know, there's, it's, it's basically an efflux protein. It kicks drugs out of your body or, or out of uh, tissue, basically, right? So, quote, we were interested in exploring the impact of chemical diversity, increased tubulin binding, lack of efflux, on the efficacy and safety of a tubulicin ADC compared to an MMAE ADC, right? Cool idea, very cool idea, because tubulicin is probably the better drug here. The latter is being well characterized preclinically and clinically. All right, good. So that's that's the basis of this paper, is to like create an antibody drug conjugate based on tubulicin. All right. And with the goal, obviously, as a company to make a lot of money, I mean, there's a ton of money in antibody drug conjugates. So I think that's, you know, Genentech is definitely seeking uh, some, uh, like a marketable substance here. Okay. Okay. So what does PGP do again? Remember PGP? I, we talked about it earlier in the course. Uh, it was this, this, uh, multi, uh, this efflux pump that's expressed in different tissues of your body. Uh, this is what it looked like chemically. It's PDB uh, 4F 4C, Nature 2012. Basically, dr certain drugs get kicked out of cells, okay, or or types of tissue, uh, and in this case, tumor cells. So the drugs get kicked out of tumor cells, and that really is annoying if you're trying to kill the tumor, right? Okay. 
So that's the PGP dose. Okay, so back to the paper. Um, so uh, they're going to talk. They're talking about this carbamate linkage. Remember the carbamate that was like next next to the valine and the citrulline. So that I'll show it in a second. It's called the MC uh, VC PABC linker, utilized in many clinical ADCs, is highly stable when attached to specific sites on an antibody. That's really good. So you can attach this to antibodies, right? And it releases an amine when it's cleaved by lysosomal proteases, such as cathepsins, which we were just talking about also, right? Cathepsins are a protease that is upregulated in a lot of tumor cells. Okay, so this kind of shows the idea. Here's your antibody drug conjugate. Here's the antibody, MAB. It's attached through the sulfur, like a cysteine, a cysteine to this malayamid thing. A little bit of a linker. Here's your valine. There's your citrulline. There's the red cleavage point the, where the cathepsin cleaves. And this is what I was talking about earlier. After the bond cleaves, now you have an amino benzene and this thing. And then the amine kicks in, double bond shift around, benzene double bond kicks off this whole thing, and that liberates CO2, carbon dioxide also, and then you get your drug, tubulation. Really cool. So there's the antibody. That's the, if you talk to protease chemists, like, uh, I think like uh, Charlie Craig at UCSF is like, I think the biggest protease chemist I know. But um, they always talk about sessile bonds. So sessile means like the bond that is cleaved by protease. So this is the sessile bond cleaved by the cathepsin. Uh, this, is, this has a funny name, this weird linker. It's called a self-emulative linker, meaning once that gets cleaved, it self-destructs. It destroys itself. And that um, liberates the uh, tubulation. Okay. So it's also uh, it's also a spacer. That's this is another interesting point I didn't know. Not only does it fall off, but it actually enhances the activity of tubulation. So it being here, it being here, uh, improves the activity of tubulation because tubulation is a big protein itself. And I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, step back. Uh, cathepsin, cathepsin, cathepsin is the the protease that cleaves this, right? Cathepsin cleaves this. It's a big protein, you know, and it cares about neighboring stuff and it doesn't seem to care about this linker here. And but like if this was somehow attached directly to the, uh, the drug, cathepsin wouldn't work as well. OK, that's a kind of interesting thing also. All right, cool. Uh, so we also lose, lose CO2. You can see where the CO2 is lost, right? And he, this is a key point. What kind of amine do we get? A secondary amine. See that, the secondary amine? And this is called tubulescent M. And that's compound number one in the paper. All right? That's going to come back in a second. So, quote, um, well, actually, this is my quote. <laughs> one could envision using this strategy to generate a demethylated tubulescent analog, basically secondary amine. Okay, because the, the real tubulicin is not a secondary amine, it's a tertiary amine, all right? That's going to come back in a second also, right? So this, this strategy, you know, assuming this works as a warhead, that would be kind of cool. But we'll see there's a problem with this one. So tubulicin M may not be amenable to the linker connection because it possesses a tertiary amine. So let's, this, is this is called NH tubulicin M. What about tubulicin M? Look at this molecule. This is the actual active warhead, okay? Um, and what kind of amine is this? It's not a secondary amine. This is a tertiary amine, tertiary amine. Okay, so this is a, pro this is a problem potentially because how could this work? How could this all work if your goal is to make a tertiary amine, right? You can see how... We have, see this linkage right here, how it's like a, a nitrogen, it's like a secondary amide, amide, secondary amide, and how the secondary amide cleaves to make a secondary amine. How could you do that to give a tertiary amine? Um, 
Well, you could imagine attaching the linker right onto the nitrogen, and that's what they're going to do. Okay. Um, it looks a little crazy, and the nitrogen would have a positive charge, but it all does seem to work. Okay. Okay, so this is back to the paper. We employed this strategy with an easily accessible potent analog of tubulosin AM to generate this secondary amine. So they're trying the secondary amine first, which is compound one we just saw. And it's carbamate linked ADC using cysteine engineered antibody. Um, at, uh, this is uh, this is a site on the antibody. It's uh, the light chain of the antibody, K149C. What does that mean? Anybody know? K149C. Anybody, any guesses? K149C. K149C. So it's it's on the it's part of the antibody. What does that usually mean? A, no, a letter number letter. Letter number letter. So that is a, it's a mutation site. So they, and somebody said it, yeah, <laughs> amino acid mutation. Yeah, so it's a lysine that was mutated to a cysteine. And why do they do that? Well, cysteine is more nucleophilic. So they want to attach it to your drug, use something that's nucleophilic, more nucleophilic. Sulfur is more nucleophilic than a lysine NH2, right? Okay, so this kind of just shows, this is back to what they're doing, right? They got the antibody, uh, attached um they got the malayamid they have their cathepsin linker and then and then essentially this all happens they get the secondary amine okay versus the alternate drug which is tubulosin am2 which is the tertiary amine okay secondary amine tertiary amine and unfortunately consistent with other recent reports removal of the methyl group to enable ADC linkage, right? That's what they're trying to do, resulted in a dramatic loss of potency. So this actually looked really cool. They tried it. It didn't work very well. As compound one was about 18 to almost 180 times less potent than the tertiary amine. So that's a kind of a bummer, right? This is another uh, interesting point. Um, the, the the actual conjugate, so not only does that referring to the the tubule license, it's also saying ADC compound number four, which is this, you know, this is the, the full conjugate, was also inactive against lymphoma cells. So basically, you know, in vitro, it's bad. In vivo, it's bad in a cellular environment. So it looks like this is a pretty dead strategy up top. So that's like, well, what are they going to do next? Maybe figure out a... ADC strategy that uses the tertiary amine, right? Okay, so alternatively, generating a different ammonium-based ADC, uh, they do a, a protecting group free synthesis. We generated in three steps from commercially available starting materials. They basically, now what they did is, uh, here they show the original strategy. This is the, the one with the secondary amine. They, they basically were able to create a similar antibody drug conjugate, but now look at that. This is the key part. It's a tertiary ammonium, right, or a quaternary ammonium, a quaternary ammonium that does the same exact thing then when um, cathepsin cleaves it, it kicks off, and then they, they break off, and oh, cool, tertiary amine, right? So that's kind of like the basis of this paper, right? Cool, all right. Well, it's one of the one of the things we're going to see. There's problems with this also, but now now there's basically tubulosin M was compound one. Sorry, sorry, sorry. NH tubulosin M is compound one. That's the secondary amine. Tubulosin M is compound two. That's the tertiary amine. Right. So those are the compound numbers. Um, secondary amine. There's the quaternary ammonium. That's what that's called. The nitrogen of the four things on it. And then when it cleaves, it makes a tertiary amine, okay? The resulting anti-CD22 tubulysin ADC compound 5, so that's, that's this is compound 5 now, was potent in vitro in range similar to competing ADC compound 8. Uh, that, was, that was the one with the monomethyl R-statin, the different warhead against lymphoma cell lines, okay? So that's a good start, is they were able to show that the, the like, in, in the cell culture, 
compound five actually worked. Okay. Okay, so then there's we have two other controls here. ADC6 is a negative control. So what is ADC6? I don't know if you can see it here, but the, what's the difference between ADC5 and ADC6? ADC6 has a different antibody, uh, NAPI, which is just a different protein. So they, this is good. They're, they're checking, you know, uh, CD22 is a, is a marker on cancer cells, on the, the, the lymphoma cell lines they're, they're looking for. NAPI is just a different protein. So why not try, you know, a negative control that has a, a, a non-interesting target? And that's what, that's what they're saying is ADC6 is a negative control. It does not target the, the kind of critical target, CD22. The other one that's kind of cool, what's this ADC7? ADC7. Well, that's the other one. I don't know if you can, I hope you guys can all read this. Otherwise, you can look at my PowerPoint slides later. So what's, what's the difference between 5 and 7? You may see it. 5 and 7. Um, it looks like VCS versus VCR. What, what does that mean? VCS versus VCR. Um, the C, what is C? C was a citrulline, right? That's this amino acid right right here, the citrulline. Um, and that was recognized by what? What what was the purpose of citrulline? It gets recognized by the citrulline here was a target of what enzyme? So that was the, the cathepsin, right? The cathepsin is the protease, which recognizes this amino acid. And so what, what the, the difference between five and seven is that five uses the natural, I mean, natural stereochemistry of citrulline. Seven uses the non-natural um, stereochemistry of, of citrulline. And why does that matter? Because the, the protease really cares about that, okay? about stereochemistry. And so this is a good negative control also. ADC7 is uncleavable. ADC7, this is the, the bottom one, that's uncleavable because it has the wrong stereochemistry of citrulline. So th these are what we call negative controls, right? They're trying to really tease out, you know, why their drug 5 is so good. Well, because it's targeting a good target and because it has a cleavable linker. If you change the target, you lose activity. You change the cleavability, you lose activity. Okay, good. So, and I, I, that's the red. Uh, red is the referring to that bad um, target. The kind of uh, purple color is referring to the fact that VC is R now and it's uncleavable. That's compound seven. Okay, good. And that's the stereochemistry that's shown there. Okay, good. All right, I think, and I'm not 100% sure, I didn't check the original paper. This is not shown, when this, this is drawn as R, uh, R would really be wedged. So if this is dash, dash, dash for S, this should be wedged. And it, it may not be misdrawn in paper, but I think it might be, and I have a little frowny face right there. Um, but it should be a, wed a wedge for R, okay, good. All right, so, so this is a kind of a lot of data, and I'm going to step through it very carefully and slowly for you guys. All right, so this is a, a key table in the paper, table one, in vitro cytotoxicity of tubulicin and MMAE, free drugs and antibody drug conjugates. So this is a lot of data, um, but let's just go from the top to bottom, and I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll make a statement, then we'll see it in the table. First statement, the unconjugated tubulicin M2 and MMAE Right, so the tubulicin and the aristatin uh, were potent. That is clear. These are not the antibody drug conjugates. These are just saying uh, just the drug, the, the warhead, right? Okay, so yeah, th these are uh, potent against a couple different cell cell lines. Jurcat cells are a different type of uh, it's a non non cancerous uh, lymphocyte cell. But basically, these are all. Uh, um, toxic, uh, active against a couple cell types. MMAE though, what, ooh, what's this? Um, it's inactive against uh, a PGP expressing 
cancer cell type. That, and that makes sense. Remember that we said that aristatin, monomethyl aristatin, the, the earlier drug is actually kind of bad against a PGP expressing cell type. So this actually makes sense. And also tubulation M is really good at that, uh, the PGP overexpressing cell line. Okay, that's good. Two, NH tubulation M, that's a secondary amine, was less potent, right? We said that. Well, let's look at it. Okay, yeah, it's definitely the, the IC50s are a little bit higher now. So it's, it's active, but not as active. So secondary amine, kind of bad. Tertiary amine, much better, right? That's that's good. That's a conclusion we, we discussed already. Okay, good. So the, so we're cool so far? The ADC based on tubulysin M, this is the one that created the secondary amine, is totally dead. That's this one. So... This is the one that um, um, so this is the one that creates a secondary amine, and it's it's very uh, low low IC fifty. Okay, tubulation based ADC five and MMAE based ADC eight were very potent against these lympho lymphoma cell types. Okay, so this is the tubulation one and versus the monomethyl R-statin one. All right, so that's that's good. That's the that's the compound five is the, the kind of the new one, right? That makes a tertiary amine, very nice. You know, reasonable potency against a couple different uh, cell types. So these are the antibody drug conjugates and we see reasonable activity against both of them. Significantly, ADC5 retained activity against the PGP overexpressing cell line. So this is a special cell line that has a lot of PGP in it, the, the drug efflux protein, while MMAE1 was totally inactive. That's what they wanted to see, right? Look at that, 25 nanomolar greater than 380 nanomolar. And that's exactly what you're expecting because anything with MMAE gets efflux, right? Um, you see it there. You also saw it up here with the unconjugated drug, compound three, right? Okay. ADC activity was also antigen specific, meaning that they, they um, if they targeted, um, oh, actually, okay, ADC activity was antigen specific, meaning that JERCAT cells, which is a, a, a lymphocyte cell that does not contain CD22, the target of the antibody, is dead. Good. They want to see that. They wanted to see, you know, that it's not targeting healthy cells, right? That's a good result. That's also the case for the MMAE one. So in both cases, you know, targeting um, a healthy cell that doesn't have the CD22 antigen is um, is fine. And, and the, the compounds are less potent against them. All right. Good. All right. And also, if we target a different protein as not CD22, but a NAPI, which is a, just a different protein altogether, that was also inactive. That's good. And that's including um, the tubulation M molecule, totally inactive. And the other thing, inactivity of tubulation ADC7, which has the opposite chirality. Remember the chirality thing at citrulline? Um, if you do that, it's also dead. So that just shows this good data that's showing that it's, you know, uh, that they are, uh, you know, target specific and also getting cleaved specifically by cathepsin, right? So who's the best compound here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight, like the one they want to maybe continue with. Any guesses? As an antibody drug conjugate, I guess your options would be four, five, six, seven, or eight. So which has the most green? It's probably going to be compound five, right? Compound five seems to be the, the best one, right, so far. Okay, uh, the other thing, this just shows that uh, nicely, the uh, compound seven again, which is the one with the opposite stereochemistry of citrulline. So that just shows the R stereochemistry, and that's that's just not lead by cathepsin. All right.
Good. So anyway, money-wise, it looks like compound five is the best one, right? I mean, it seems to be active against what we want it to be active, not less active against healthier cells. Okay, good. Okay, next. Thus, they selected this quaternary ammonium linked to lysine ADC5 to evaluate in a human lymphoma xenograft in mice. So what does that mean? They're, they're basically injecting lymphoma cells into a mouse for the sake of seeing, can we, can we kill those lymphoma cells? That's a, that's a xenograft, right? So they're injecting human cancer cells into a mouse, which is called a xenograft. Okay, so there it is. There's their moneymaker, compound five. And it cleaves again to make the tertiary amine. Unexpectedly, this new ADC5 showed very moder modest tumor growth inhibition after a single IV dose of one mg per kg, um, whereas the competing ADC, the MMAE1, afforded complete tumor regression through day 28 at a matched dose. Uh-oh, that's, that's bad, right? That's not what they want to see. They wanted to see 5 be the, the blockbuster and 8 being the bad one, right? You can see that right here, actually, in a nice uh, time, time graph. Um, so vehicle is like nothing at all, and that's just showing the tumor just going crazy. Uh, the, then the red one is the MMAE, MMAE one. Right, the competing warhead, and look at that, the tumor just really goes away, right? And then the blue one is the one of tubulysin, and that just kind of is actually not really working very well. I mean, it's working better than vehicle, but you you must say that <laughs> their drug looks like it's uh, not not too good, right? The one they want to make a ton of money. Well, that's a problem, right? Uh oh, money's gonna <laughs> dissipate here pretty quickly. Um, all right, so this in vitro, in vivo disconnect, right? What does that mean? In vitro, in vivo disconnect. It means it kind of worked in vitro, meaning like in a in cell culture, but in vivo, like in a mouse, it didn't work very well. This in vitro, in vivo disconnect led us to investigate the in vivo stability of the two ADCs, five and eight, five being theirs. Eight being the aristatin one. Both ADCs comprised maleamids. What's a maleamid? It was the funny five-member ring that is attached to the antibody with via sulfur. Both ADCs comprised of maleamids conjugated to the same site, the same site of the antibody, same site of a cysteine-engineered antibody. So, right, cysteine-engineered means lysine to cysteine with a drug antibody ratio to two. So it looks like they had two drugs to every antibody. So I think that what I think what that means is there's, um, I think there's there maybe two light chains and there's two of these sites and, and the drug, there's two drugs to, to the overall antibody. Okay, so that antibody site was selected because it forms a highly stable connection to malamid linker drugs. Genentech is super good at this stuff of like figuring out which amino acid to mutate and things like that. They're they're very they're experts at figuring out what amino acid you know to mutate in order to attach conjugates. So this was a very special uh, you know uh, secret from Genentech. Okay, so they did LCMS analysis determined in vivo stability. They noted a loss. Uh, consistent with acetate. Look at this. They noted uh, noted loss consistent with cleavage of the acetate. What that means is by mass spec they figured out, oh no, the acetate was going away. Oh no. that Why would that happen? Any guesses? Why, of all things, to cleave? Which is the easiest thing to cleave in a, <laughs> one of the easiest to cleave functional groups in organic chemistry? An ester. <laughs> so, doesn't it's not too surprising that that ester, that ester was getting wiped off somehow. Hydrolysis, acid, or not maybe an esterase or some kind of enzyme cleaved it off. Right, good. They measured the drug activity ratio for five versus eight. So five being theirs, eight versus the competing one, the aristatin one. And look at this. So they were just measuring that over days. Um, I think in media, I'm not sure if this is in cell, cell, cell culture media or something, but basically look at that. The red one is the compete, competing one. 
it's stable. It's like a rock. Nothing unstable about that. But their compound, oh no, it seems to degrade, 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 degrade. Probably loss of the acetate, right? Okay, so what's the most logical thing to do? If ester is a unstable functional group, any, you guys remember what we saw in the, in the abstract? What functional group is a lot more stable than an ester? It also begins with the letter E. Functional groups that begin with letter E. Ester, organic one. <laughs> First couple lectures of organic one. Functional group names. Uh, ether, right? Esters. Esters are a, kind of an unstable, hydro, hydrolytically unstable functional group. Ethers are actually almost rocks. Ethers are very, very, un, very, very stable. So unlike to, to cleave. So their idea is like, what if we have an ether, like a three carbon ether, uh, propyl ether? Well, that would be really cool because that would solve this problem. Maybe it should it should solve the problem that they're facing here. Okay. Okay. So there's their uh, there's their money maker getting degraded in a few days, sitting in water basically. Um, okay, so they explore two approaches to improve the in vivo stability. Two approaches that are both very good and complementary. These are their strategies on how to make this work. Okay. Method one minimize and prevent the putative enzyme mediated deacetylation. And their idea is you know, they, they have a whole army of people that engineer antibody linkages. So utilize cysteine engineering to identify an antibody site to protect the, con the conjugated small molecule from metabolism. So maybe like change where, where the, where the, you know, the antibodies linked or something like that. Thus they identified antibody site that decreased tubulice and acetate cleavage and subsequently improved efficacy. It sounds like they actually did this and at least at that time the paper was in preparation. I haven't checked that. Uh, maybe, maybe this is published now. The idea of just you know change the antibody and what's our our second strategy we just said second the second strategy a more general solution is just uh that without requiring antibody engineering replace the acetate with a stable isosteer isosteer is just like a fragment of the molecule while retaining potency so tubulation analogs with propyl ether propyl ether or n propyl amide because amides are also um Amides are also um, stable, afforded low nanomolar or potency. That's where they replaced the acetate and modified the amide. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Let me, let me take that back. Um, yeah, they did two things, actually. I'm sorry. Uh, two things. One is they replaced the oxygen with the, the uh, ester with an ether. The second thing is they turned the N-methyl group into an N-propyl group because a propyl group is a little more stable against what p450 or whatever right um cool all right good okay so bad and then this is like question mark question mark question mark and also the propyl group i think that's actually probably pretty good but that was the that was the, the where they took this research project is let's just see what the propyl is all about okay and then, then that new molecule they, they go from tubulice nam which is compound two and now it's going to be called tub tubulice and pr for propyl nine that's new compound number is compound nine Okay. Okay. Synthesis. I'm gonna probably just breeze over this, or maybe I'll maybe I'll step through it really quickly. It's um, um, you know, this is multi-step synthesis. It's not that crazy. I'll just do it kind of quickly. If you guys want to, uh, if you're interested in this, you know, uh, you can go back to the video later. Essentially, ketone amine makes an imine, right? Organic too. And then they used a base to rip off the proton, and then they attacked an aldehyde, took off a proton, attacked an aldehyde, that made this, this alcohol. This whole thing here is called a chiral auxiliary, which helps them kind of maintain their chirality. And this thing set the chirality of the OH. So now it's a, a chiral secondary alcohol. Uh, they need that alcohol. So th this thing allowed them to give the, the right stereochemistry right there. Uh, then it looks like they reduced the imine to an amine in ABH4. Propyl iodide, you put the propyl on, there's their key propyl that they need. Uh, HCl took off the chiral auxiliary, the little sulfonamide thing, whatever. 
And then uh, they did uh, reductive amination, which is just attaches a propyl group to the amine, that other propyl group they need. Remember the, the second propyl? So there's their second propyl group. This is organic two chemistry, reductive amination. Uh, this is this is um, the uh, remember the this is where they, they form the um, that that amide linkage with the azide as a protecting group. So the nitrogen attacks except the chloride. Now they're kind of building this up. Palladium H2 cleaves the azide to an amine. Then they the couple the uh, this amino acid to the nitrogen, probably with like ADCI. Got the amide, lithium hydroxide, cleaves this propyl ester. They cleave the propyl ester specifically. DIC, um, uh, the, the phenol thing, that creates, and then they, they throw in this amino acid that they created. And now they've kind of attached this part, the right side. And then they attach the, uh, the linker with the, uh, the cleavage site, and then they throw in the antibody. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, th I'm gonna talk about this one step in a second, because this is actually kind of cool. I thought this is one of the, if you're gonna study one thing, it's probably this, this step up here. But then they throw in the antibody, the cysteine engineered antibody, and then they get their, their thing. With the propyl group and the, um, the alkyl group, the, the end propyl there. All right, good. All right, so th this is one kind of cool synthetic step. If they wanted to attach an amino acid to this amine, you would just you could just use an acid chloride, right? And then like a, a protecting group, like FMOC. FMOC is another protecting group. I don't know if I've talked about that one. But yeah, you could just attach it and deprotect, right? 5% yield. <laughs> if you don't know anything about organic chemistry, you should know that low yield is bad, right? 5% is kind of unacceptable. Especially for Genentech people, because they're uh, you know making tons of this stuff. Five percent yield is bad. So this is where they all they did is they swapped the FMOC for the azido acid chloride, like a different protecting group, and it resulted in a fourteen fold increase of yield. And then they got the intermediate they wanted. So all they did was they switched it to the azide acid chloride. Oh no! Wow, look at that. Now they got seventy percent yield. Reduce the azide and then they make the, the amine. So that's, that shows a, a pretty cool uh, optimization, right? Something that's bad got replaced with something that's good. And all, all they did is basically a different protecting group. Like azide as a protecting group is sort of cool. Okay, good. All right, so this is the, we, made, we showed this table earlier. Now we're going to kind of finish it up. We improved tubulysin propyl with improved tubulysin propyl analog 9, the new thing they made. We were able to remove the metabolic liability, right? The metabolic liability while retaining low double digit picomolar potency. So that's like sub nanomolar found with tubular SNAM. So basically, let's compare two and versus nine. Two was the original tubular SNAM, the tertiary amine, and compound nine was their new one. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. Two versus nine. Basically, the same compound, right? Good. This retained potency was also observed in antibody drug conjugates, the, 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 the quaternary ammonium based one, which is compound 10. So this is compound 10 is, is analogous to compound five, right? So let's compare five versus 10. Uh, generally speaking, it's pretty potent, right? Similarly potent against these BJAB uh, tumor cells. Also similarly potent against this WSU tumor cell line. And, um, and also kind of similarly potent against the, the uh, PGP one, right? The PGP effluxing uh, tumor cells. Okay, so yeah, generally speaking, you say five and 10, pretty good, right? 10 matches five, right? Which killed lymphoma cells in a target specific manner, meaning that if they created um, uh, conjugate number 11, that used the nappy target, which is a just a, a off target, and that was totally dead. So it's just showing, you know, they they have a very specific, cool antibody, right? Antibody drug conjugate that's very specific for CD22, and that is, you know, tube, that's using the propyl technology seems to be uh, maybe a little more um, um, metabolically uh, favorable. Okay, good.
There's their money maker now. So Compound 10 seems to be the, the new money maker, okay? Okay, so now let's look at the in vivo efficacy of a second generation tubal lysin, ADC10. So in vivo evaluation of the conjugate was necessary to full, fully understand how changing the tubal lysin structure would impact both ADC stability and efficacy. So they needed to do it in a mouse, right? So they evaluated the anti-tumor effects of the new one in a same thing, human lymphoma xenograft model in mice. Okay, so there it is. There's their new new one with the propyl and the also the N N propyl amine. And they have combat 10 is the good one, eleven's the off target one. And also the third thing was the, the quaternary ammonium thing. So that creates the the uh, tertiary amine when it cleaves. Okay, let's see it. The stabilized tubulysin propyl one resulted in tumor stasis for 21 days when administered at a single dose of one mg per kg. So here, let's look at this data. All right, so the vehicle is like nothing. That's the black line. Uh, also, the nappy one. They did the nappy, which is the off-target one. Well, that matches vehicles. So that's like totally dead, totally dead. Um, so it looks like so the the squares. The bottom one is their their new tube lysin propyl one uh, at one mg per kg. So it's actually doing really well, killing the tumor over 30 days. Um, the red one is their competitor, uh, but the thing about it, and 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 also this third line is they're a good one, their new one, but at 0.5 mg per kg. You might say that this is an unfair comparison, right? Um, uh, uh, well, it appears to be better than the MMAE one, right? However, they are at a higher dose, right? And that might be an unfair comparison, right? One mg per kg of the bottom one versus 0.5 mg per kg of the uh, of the red one, the competitor, you might say it's an unfair comparison. Um, and I, I would probably agree with that. I think to be, you know, it would be nice if they had added the MMAE one at one mg per kg. That would be a good comparison. Um, but we'll see there's other, other reasons that compound 10 is uh, superior. Okay, good. Response was dose dependent. We, we see that, that's always nice to see dose dependence with modest tumor growth inhibition observed at 0.5, but the, to really get this to work, they needed one mg per kg, which is still not that much material, right? One milligram per kilogram of body weight. Okay, so there's their money maker. Response is target specific. Of course, the nappy one is totally dead, is totally inactive. However, but is this really a fair head to head? I don't think it is. I think because the doses aren't, uh, uh, consistent. Okay, so fortunately they have more uh, compelling data um, and that's what this is now. Okay, the more compelling data to really show why compound 10 is better than compound 8. Do you guys remember why comp what was wrong with compound 8? Anybody remember? What was wrong with MMAE as a warhead? So earlier in the lecture we said MMAE is bad because why? It was bad because of the, um, it's efflux, right? So the tubulation should be a little bit more resistant to efflux. So let's look, let's look at that. So very lastly, one of the most compelling reasons to utilize tubulations as payloads instead of MMAE payloads is the potential to overcome multi-drug resistance. So let's look at that data. As they previously reported, they they derived that they also derived uh, uh, lymphoma mouse xenograft models that were resistant to MMAE, and those are the ones that had PGP overexpression. Okay, a lot of cancer cell lines are have PGP overexpression. These models were characterized to have upregulation of PGP. Efflux transporter while maintaining equivalent letters levels of CD22. CD22 is the target on the surface of the cell. Okay, that's so. Let's see that data now. They use this model here as it represents acquired resistance to the previous generation of ADCs um, uh, targeting tubulin. Okay, 
Um, so because a lot of a lot of ADCs that target tubulin are having this problem of multi-drug resistance. Okay. Thus, they tested tubulin propyl and the MMAE ADCs head to head in a VJAB Luke PGP lymphoma model. So this is the these are lymphoma cells that have PGP overexpression in mice. This is a mouse data, and this is the that last figure. And you can see that this is actually pretty pretty compelling, and it shows that their compound 10 is, uh, well, first of all, compound 11 was the nappy one. That's totally, totally dead. Um, compound 10 at either 1 mg or 2 mg are these bottom two lines. And the 2 mg one is the better one. It shows, you know, pretty, pretty substantial um, inhibition against a very aggressive cancer cell type so this is a this is a hard competition but it is showing that it's that you know it's not perfect but it's definitely the best at at uh, a two megs per kg it's actually doing pretty good good work the mmae one at one mig and even eight mig is uh pretty bad relatively speaking pretty bad so that was like the kind of the, the final re major result here mme based eight was dosed up to eight megs per kg and it gave minimal tum tumor growth inhibition the new stabilized tubulation propyl number 10 gave a clear dose dependent tumor growth inhibition resulting at 74% tumor growth inhibition at two megs per kg. And so this is kind of like their final like super duper uh, compound. And you know, it's a pretty cool result, I would say. The improved activity of the tubulation propyl ADC relative to MMAE ADC in this, uh, this multi-drug resistant model is likely a result of the released tubulin propyl payload not being a substrate for efflux, right? And also the propyl this seems to be good for you know avoiding the hydrolysis and all that kind of stuff. So there it is. There are conclusions. We have employed a peptide linker combined with a quaternary ammonium salt linker connection to provide a stable and bioreversible connection of tubulicins to antibody, meaning they, they connect it and it's biologically reversible, meaning cleavable, right? Furthermore, we identified and addressed the metabolism of an acetate ester critical to activity through its replacement with a propyl ether. That's a conclusion. The resulting conjugate was highly stable and efficacious against both drug sensitive and multi-drug resistant tumor models. I think that was, you know, pretty, pretty well demonstrated here. The latter, latter activity substantially differentiates this tubulicin ADC from the other clinically validated MMAE ADC and generates excitement for its further investigation, which I think is also a pretty valid conclusion. Okay, so Great, and and so your paper um, is not this one, <laughs> the one for the your final exam, which is basically you know uh, it's another homework assignment, is a different paper. Okay, so I just want to talk about that briefly. Any questions on this uh, before I uh, switch to the other paper? Uh, we're we're very close to done. I'm thinking we'll be completely done in about ten minutes or so, ten fifteen max, and then we're completely done with everything as opposed to another asynchronous lecture. Um, any questions? I thought it was a pretty cool paper. Anybody, any other comments or anything? Hopefully it kind of made sense what it was going on. I tried to step through all the crucial parts of this. So, okay. Somebody said, interesting and neat. I agree, very interesting, very neat. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump into the other paper. Okay. Parting thoughts related to your final homework assignment. All right. So, um, what was the name of the phase two metabolite that looked kind of like glucose, kind of ish, but with a carboxylic acid? Remember that the phase two metabolite? It was let's call it XXX. Do you anybody know what it was? It was had gluc in it? Gluc something? Gluc something acid? Gluc? I don't know. All right. Let's call it XXXX for now, okay? Um, if there was an enzyme that would cleave XXXXXX, what would it be called? Well, 
what it may, you know, things that, what are enzymes that cleave things usually called? Like, if I'm cleaving an ester, what's the enzyme called that cleaves an ester? It's called a, called a ester cleavage enzyme called a, <laughs> is it probably seen this in biochemistry now a little bit? Something, you know, something that, an enzyme that cleaves something is usually called ACE, right? <laughs> something ACE, somebody emailed or texted me, something ACE, I agree. So maybe it should be called blah, 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 ACE, right? That's usually what cleaves something, right? Wouldn't it be cool if blah, 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 ACE was expressed in high quantities in a tumor microenvironment leading to tumor localized drug delivery? Wouldn't that be cool? That would be cool because then I could maybe have this XXXX thing on there in a way that it's stable, but when it sees the tumor, it gets snipped off and then the, the payload gets released, right? Wouldn't that be cool? I think it'd be cool. Um, okay, so this is going to be your paper, and I'm not going to really say much about this paper. I'm going to let you get. I would read it first before you try the homework. Uh, it's on the it's on the I learn already, uh, so you can take a look. See here, it's JMed Chem 2012. I thought it was a really cool paper. It was a really cool idea. It's another uh, antibody drug conjugate type thing, but it doesn't use it doesn't use cathepsin, right? Cathepsin was the protease that cleaved you know the that that liberated the previous antibody drug conjugate okay so uh this is essentially what the, what this this looks like i'm not going to say very much about it but doxorubicin is the payload this is a, a dna gyrase inhibitor i think uh a dna intercalator so this is very cytotoxic up top so something's got to happen in the tumor microenvironment for this to get released and to do this damage to the tumor cells. Oh, what's this thing called? Glucuronic acid. Well, that's that phase two metabolite thing we're looking at. So maybe something happens like a XXXX ACE that cleaves off glucuronic acid. And um, what's this thing called? This, this kind of linker that falls apart called self emulative linker. We saw that. And then, and then what's this thing over here? What's this thing over here? Mal Malayamid, we said. What's this? What does this get attached to? Anybody know? We saw that essentially identical, this, this part identical in the last paper. What, what's this used for? The uh, attachment of the antibody, right? Cysteine or whatever. So this, this thing gets, this is electrophilic, right? This thing gets attacked by like a sulfur, like a cysteine or something. And then, and then this is kind of how it gets linked onto the antibody. Okay. So, yeah, very cool. Um, and actually, though, I think just, just uh, remembering this paper a little bit more, I don't think this is actually an antibody drug conjugate. Um, I think it's linked to albumin, which, which is a blood protein, a protein in blood. I think this is good. So albumin is kind of like a, like a blood delivery device. So it delivers the, the substance uh, through your blood kind of to the, the tumor microenvironment. So this is not an antibody drug conjugate, but it's some like an uh, albumin uh, drug conjugate. <laughs> okay. And albumin binding prodrug of doxorubicin. Okay, cool. Um, so we're, we're almost almost done, uh, and I'm still gonna. I just want to finish this, and I'll, I'll, I'll record it also. Uh, I, I'm just gonna be a little bit. I want to show with my little uh, webcam thing. Parting thoughts related. There's also in the synthesis they use the deprotection of an allyl related protecting group, and I just want to uh, give you tips on that mechanism. Okay, allyl. What's allyl? So this just shows the the overall reaction. So if I have a uh, allyl ester. Allyl is this this thing here on the right, CH two alkene, right? Allyl. So it's a cool protecting group that, in the exposure of palladium zero and uh, triphenylphosphine, there's actually four. I'm missing the, the number four here, and a nucleophile. Essentially, it cleaves this. So this is a very cool protecting group for an ester because this is very mild. I mean, palladium zero. Palladium zero does not do anything to any molecule except it loves <laughs> certain things it does react with. 
like an allyl group. But it, generally speaking, this is a very uh, mild deprotection mechanism, right? Okay, that's that's the that there there's that's what the PD zero for PPH three, and there's I'm missing the number four. So there's uh, four of these triphenylphosphines. The there are these uh, things, and the palladium is in the middle, right? So, oh yeah, uh, the, yeah. Sorry, what's the next question? What what nucleophile? What nucleophile to use? You just need a nucleophile, a, a generic nucleophile. A couple of the nucleophiles they use. One is called dimadone, which is like is a diketone, which uh, equilibrates to this um, this enol thing. So it's nucleophilic, right? Because the oxygen can swing in and the double bond can go attack. It's a nucleophile, right? Okay, good. NDMBA is another one. This is uh, N dimethyl barbituric acid. So barbituric acid is this minus the methyls, and that's like the basis for a lot of barbiturate drugs, like the pentobarbital and things like that. Um, but anyway, it does the same thing. It's also a nucleophile. So it, it equilibrates uh, to make the enol, and the enol oxygen kicks in, double bond goes attacks, and then it would attach. Kind of in, that's how this sort of thing forms. Also, aniline, it's a nucleophile. This is a benzene and a NH2. It's, that's actually a common nucleophile for this reaction, okay? Um, okay, and so the mechanism will follow and it'll be helpful for your homework. Oh, yeah, okay. So now I'm going to switch to my webcam. It'll be about five minutes and we're all done. I just want to, I want, I got to draw this. It's a mechanism. All right, let's draw the mechanism. Okay, so let's get the webcam going here. Okay, piece of paper. So I got to show a little bit on the on how these allyl uh, protecting groups are are deprotected. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm ready now. All right, I'm ready. Okay, so cleavage of an allyl ester. Let's just talk about that real quick. Cleavage of an allyl ester. Pen's dying. All right, so how does this work? Um, let's draw an allyl ester. There's an allyl ester. And um, what was the thing we were reacting with? Uh, palladium. Basically, palladium, P, PH, 3, 4. And uh, nuke, a nucleophile, all right? Palladium with palladium zero with a nucleophile, and you get out the carboxylic acid, and the allyl group is now in the nucleophile. Okay, so how does this work? Um, so the way it works, I'm going to redraw the ester, kind of poking down, and I'm going to have palladium zero sort of hanging there 
Uh, it's a little blurry, but just you can you can see what I'm doing. It's PD zero, palladium zero. Okay, PD zero. Dot 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 dot. Actually, let's sorry. Actually, that's yeah, that's that's okay. So what happens is the palladium talks to and interacts with a double bond, so it forms a complex. That looks like this. Palladium dot 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 like that. Palladium it was palladium zero, right? So the first thing that happens is the palladium kind of sits around, then the palladium kind of forms a interaction, like a dot dot dot. It's a interaction. Okay. And so then what happens is the double bond attacks the palladium. And then the palladium attacks this carbon simultaneously kicks off the carboxylate. That happens. All right, we're almost we're, we're getting, getting through this. All right. So what does that create? Now, palladium does this kind of weird looking uh, structure now where palladium is attached to the three carbon piece. And we sort of show a little dot, 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 dot thing and a plus charge. So palladium is now interacting with this three carbon piece. Okay, this is almost like inorganic chemistry. And there's a plus charge right there in the middle. Plus charge, okay. Okay, this thing is called a pi allyl palladium complex. A pi allyl palladium complex. The nucleophile then simply attacks like the terminal carbon, which breaks this off and regenerates the double bond. What does that give you? It gives you a new molecule. Now that, let's redraw it nicely. That and the palladium is now kind of interacting with the alkene, just like it was interacting with the alkene initially, because it uh, palladium likes to do that. Okay, and then you're done. So then it falls off, and you got now. Now you have your nucleophile attached to the allyl group, and that's what we draw up top. Sorry, this didn't work out super well, but you can you can kind of see it all again. So the first the ester kind of uh, sees the palladium, then the palladium kind of interacts with the double bond. Then this kind of weird double bond, you know, attacks the palladium, and then the palladium attacks the carbon breaks the bond, that's how it actually deprotects. Ester gets a carboxylic acid uh, proton from somewhere. And then you have the pi allyl palladium complex, nucleophile attacks, breaks off on the palladium, and swings down and around, and you're basically done. Okay. Um, and lastly, one more little thing and we're all done. Remember, uh, whenever you have um, like kind of like an amine on one side and an oxygen on the other, this has a functional group name. What's this called? Anybody remember? It's not an amide. It's not an ester. Anybody remember this type of uh, functional group pattern? It's called a carbamate. 
Okay. Because this is not an this is kind of like an ester. We just saw the you know you to get rid of that. That now it looks like what we just saw the ester. When you have a nitrogen, uh, this actually becomes a uh, a nitrogen protecting group, right? This whole thing is a nitrogen protecting group that when you get when it gets liberated, uh, relieves the uh, the nitrogen, the amine, right? And this whole thing is the name of this whole protecting group is called alloc. Alloc. Okay, so this gets cleaved. Well, how does this? How does this all get deprotected? All right. So what? Okay, so we do the same exact thing we just did. Same. And what happens then is, so if we do exactly what we just did, this gets kicked off, and you get. that okay what is the, anybody remember what this is called this is not a carbamate this is called a that's a carbamate this is a carbam something carbam called a carbamic acid okay and this falls apart. Anybody remember how that happens? Because you did this when, when we talked about the Bach, Bach deprotection. Essentially, the oxygen lone pair, oxygen lone pair swings in, kicks off, and then you create CO2. Okay. This, you did the same. This is all. Um, Essentially, homework four, I think, was where I, what I what I have down. Homework four was where you did this, but you did it for a Bach group. And for the Bach group, I'm not going to review all of that, but Bach group is also a carbamate. Bach, that's a Bach. It did the same thing with acid, where you got the carbamic acid. And then the oxygen kicked it off, and you made the amine. So you could say there's a little bit of a pattern here, right? That that carbamates, this is also a carbamate, that carbamates get cleaved to make carbamic acids, and carbamic acids fall apart with loss of CO2 to give amines, okay? Um, uh, I just want to show one last thing. One last thing. <laughs> Sorry, I think we might need this for the homework. So I just want to show this one last thing. If we let's just do one last variation of this. One last thing, and then you'll you'll actually have a little bit more of a understanding of protecting groups. All right, what did I do here? What did I do here? Now I just have an I have an alcohol. And it looks like a carbamate, right? All, all, oxygen, oxygen, acetyl bond O, oxygen, right? But this is not a carbamate, the way this is a carbamate. What's, anybody know what this is called? This is another uh, functional group. This is called a carbonate. And it can do the same exact thing. I just want to, and then we'll be done with this. So, You can do the same thing with the allyl, the allyl group, and it gets deprotected. And how might this, this, uh, this kind of carboxylic acid looking thing, degrade to form the alcohol? Well, it's the same thing as we did for the amine where the car carbamic acid, where the oxygen kicked in and then uh, made CO2, kicked off the nitrogen. Well, this same thing can happen here. And now you have an alcohol, okay? So, um, so in closing, alloc, 
Alloc is kind of related. Alloc is an amine protecting group. It's kind of based on allyl ester. This would be an allyl ester. Allyl ester is a carboxylic acid protecting group. This is a amine protecting group called alloc. It's kind of similar to the idea of Bach. It's just Bach is removed with acid, which is also an amine protecting group. But there's also this idea of a carbonate, a car allyl carbonate, allyl carbonate, right? Allyl carbonate, which is essentially a protecting group for alcohols. Okay. Good. I think that's all I needed to mention. This this will get you totally through the homework uh, assignment. And we have a couple kind of biology questions. Just read that paper. Start with the paper and then go through the problems. And I think you'll you guys will do fine. All right. Any parting questions? <laughs> Sorry, I wanted to pack this in, but now we are completely done with the material and no more videos. Um, All right. Well, good luck on the homework. If you guys have questions, you can email is, email is the easiest for me. Um, I do have normal office hours for my Chem 233 as well, but um, I think email has been pretty effective if you guys have uh, homework questions or whatever to finish this last one up. All right. See you guys. Hope you enjoyed the semester. <laughs> Learned a little bit, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.